Jonge då. Verklos. Kunskap. Education. Erfarenhet. Frihet. Security. Styrka. Mobility. Technology. Idéen. Möjligheter. Aktie. Framtid. Debate Changing Europe is a project organized by the International Debate Education Association in cooperation with national debating societies at the university level in Austria, Portugal, the Netherlands, Germany and Sweden. In public debates and numerous training sessions, the project engaged over 700 Europeans to learn about the EU and build their knowledge and capacity to effectively voice their opinion in Europe. My name is uh, Yvonne Heesmans, I'm the director of ID Netherlands and I love my job because ID is actually teaching young people to debate. So it's an educational organization and we learn young people to debate about relevant issues like inclusion of young people, like migration, water issues, food, all kinds of issues and we believe that debate will help them to learn how to bring their voices and to learn how to bring the message across but also it learns them to listen to each other and to understand that one subject has different perspectives and they learn how to listen to other perspectives and then also to respect other ones perspective. We really encourage and empower young people, the future policy makers, to use the debate skills for advocacy. So actually, debate change in Europe, actually we see them as the pure bridge between those excluded and those in power. And we really see that they have the capacity to debate, they have the knowledge, and now we want to push them to bring those messages to Brussels in a way that policymakers can listen there and can incorporate it in their future policy plans. Debate Changing Europe marketed IDEA's first step to reach out to a student audience and engage the young policymakers of tomorrow, today. What do you think? Join us in debate. Welcome everybody. Also on behalf of my colleague Iris Hirschel and uh, my other colleague uh, Anne Valkering, um, uh, I'm uh, here to welcome you uh, today. My name is Karen Brummel. I'm one of the organizers of this event today. Uh, um, and uh, we're very honored and very excited to have you all here today. Um, this is a short word of welcome uh, to first introduce um, both the speakers as well as the group. Um, and then we're going to uh, do a little uh, run through of uh, the format of our debate to quickly start uh, actually the speeches. Um, I'm very happy that we got the speaker panel that we have today already completed. We thought we um, uh, would have a, a small uh, change session. Unfortunately, there's two uh, people that weren't here. We've got these four wonderful people with us today. Um, starting from left to right, um, I'd like to introduce you to um, Mr. Lucas Vesely. <coughs> Hey, uh, you, you may introduce yourself if you'd like to. Um, in the <laughs> well, why don't you try? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 this is too daring. Please, go ahead. Hello, I'm, my name is Lukas Vesely. I work for uh, Commissioner Laszlo Andor in, in his cabinet uh, for about three years now, and I work on employment policy, macroeconomic policy issues, but also youth employment, and I have been involved on, in the development of the youth guarantee. Oh, we're just going to go. No, let's, let's uh, yeah. um, Second, Ms. Uh, Marais Cornelissen, she's a representative <laughs> of the European Parliament. Um, I'm uh, in the Green Group in the European Parliament, I'm in the Social Affairs and Employment Committee, as well as in the Foreign Affairs and the Women's Rights Committees. Uh, I've been working on the European semester and also closely involved in uh, employment issues and um, uh, youth unemployment uh, is of course a huge topic within that. Thank you very much, Mr. Nes. Monsieur Savary, s'il vous plaît. Yes, uh, that's uh, such a big thing for me today. <laughs> so, uh, Mathieu Savary, so I'm a trainee at the European Commission. Um, on top of that, I'm also the president of IG Brussels, which is the European Students Forum in English, so that's a way to promote also my, my association here. Uh, at the Commission, I'm working within the DG Employment, so the same as Lukas, um, and I'm dealing particularly with the youth and employment and uh, the youth guarantee, so right now the youth guarantee implementation plans, but also the European Alliance for, for Apprenticeship and the Equality Framework for Traineeships. I think we will have the occasion to get back to the topic throughout the afternoon, but that's uh, but really thank you for, that's a big honor for me to be here. And, 
and to take the floor. It's, it's been great to have you. Thank you for being here. And then finally, our director of the International Debate Association in the Netherlands, Yvonne Eesmond. Yeah, I just introduced myself uh, by the film. But uh, they have asked me uh, to sit behind the table, especially because we also work with uh, young people in disadvantaged area. Uh, and of course, they also suffer uh, from issues like uh, youth and unemployment. <coughs> so I will especially represent as far as possible, but at least bring in some of the things I have learned when we debated with them uh, in the disadvantaged neighborhoods across uh, the Netherlands and Belgium especially. Thank you very much, uh, speakers. Um, however, it's not only about you today. Um, today, we mark uh, the final event of an incredibly exciting project uh, called Debate Changing Europe, as the video explained. Um, and um, uh, what today especially is about is our 10 youth representatives who, uh, in their own member states, uh, went to youth, to peer students, um, and debate, uh, uh, taught them how to debate different perspectives about Europe and about uh, youth employment issues. Um, therefore, I would like you to click I would like to present to you, unfortunately we do not have the time to um, uh, present everybody personally, but um, our youth panel here in the front rows, um, uh, and um, we have asked them today uh, not only to listen to your perspectives, but basically also to challenge you uh, in, in debate on uh, what they, not only what they think, but also what they took with them from all the voices in Europe they heard in Austria. Um, other, uh, <laughs> other organizations here today are lovely colleagues from Idea Central, um, the Open Society Policy Institute. Think Young, we're very excited that you're here also today. Generation Europe Foundation, European Network Against Racism and Asia Europe. Uh, very well, very welcome. Um, let, uh, let us start because um, we've got four motions uh, to start with. And the first one we would like to introduce is <coughs> the second uh, movie clip. Die Jugend ist das Potenzial unserer Zukunft. Wenn man in Jugend investiert, wenn man in Bildung investiert, investiert man auch in die Zukunft. I would like to invite uh, Mathieu Serri to open the floor on this particular motion. Yes, thank you, uh, thank you, Karen. Um, so first, I didn't mention it, but congrats to uh, to the nine youth representatives that have been uh, that have been through the uh, the very harsh selection procedure. So uh, so that's uh, that's uh, an honor to open the debate, and I'm looking forward to to hearing your input. So just a few things, a few elements to mention. I think um, to tackle the youth guarantee, um, and because I think it's important to keep them in mind uh, when we deal with the, with the funds and with the policy schemes. So the youth guarantee. First, uh, I think it's important to mention that it's a long-term investment with potential um, immediate results. Um, so, of course, it can be seen as a, as a burden for the member states, but the cost, and you can see the, um, the study that has been issued last year by the uh, International Labour Organization, uh, the cost of the needs is much higher than the, than the cost of the implementation of such schemes. Uh, second, and this is linked to the first one, um, the national budgets uh, will be key here. So um, it's really up to the member states right now that, um, to, to, de to deliver the implementation plans <coughs> and to give you youth guarantee um, um, some, some, true, some true experience. The EU action is, um, is on the one hand the impetus. So uh, we, we have been creating this, uh, this youth guarantee plan. It has been enacted by the, the council recommendation. And also the, the EU action consists in the, in the constant support so technical, technical assistance, initiatives that goes along the youth guarantees, such as the Q um, quality framework, European Alliance, and last but not least, because uh, this is what counts in times of crisis, financial support. Um, so on the one hand, you will have the YE, the Youth Employment Initiative, 6 billion euros, and on the other hand, you will have the, um, the um, European Social Fund. Now, how we divide this money um, this is the, the topic of this, uh, this motion right now. Is it fair um, just to see, just to tell, okay, the, the member states with the highest uh, um, youth unemployment should be the ones to receive the, uh, um, the money that is dedicated to, to, to the youth country? Or um, should we rather say, okay, the emergency is here, 
in this in these member states in these regions. Therefore, we, we need to act. So I think this is this is time for you to take the floor and say yes, we should do this, or we should rather um, try to be maybe um, to divide it in a, in a fair way in order to uh, not respect the sovereignty of the country. So I invite either Jose Miguel or Wilson to take the floor. Oh. I'll do that. Uh, yes, all right. Well, thank you, Mr. Savary. Uh, I am totally in favor of the idea that the hard state that are the hardest hit with youth unemployment should benefit most from this system. Uh, I think there's two main things why. The first reason is because we really want to prevent a long-term and a culture of unemployment being... Uh, coming into place in these nations and second of all because I have consulted with the Dutch students and who all very much engaged into the debate but they all agree that in the Netherlands they don't really feel it as a big issue so first of all what we see is that if people are unemployed for a very long time in a certain nation in a certain area uh, what often happens is that there is a kind of culture of unemployment People get used to the fact that they're unemployed. They uh, sometimes parents teach their children not how to get a job, but how to exploit social benefits, benefit systems. Right? We believe that this is something that is a clear thing that you don't have the moment that the youth unemployment in a certain country is uh, is lower, and there's no generic culture of unemployment in this case. And second of all. The Dutch, uh, the Dutch persons who, who told me what they thought generally agreed that uh, the Netherlands could give a little bit more towards other countries because they are so hard hit and most of the students felt that they didn't need the protection by this youth guarantee. I do agree there are some issues in the Netherlands but they all thought they weren't as big to to justify that the Netherlands would take a big part in this youth guarantee. And I guess it goes for other rich countries as well. So. Thank you. Thank you. Would uh, you like to respond with me yes. or Mr. Kai? Uh, would you stand up please okay. when speaking? Thank you. Good afternoon all. Thank you for being with us. Uh, I'm from Portugal. Uh, I really think that we have to focus in, I'm in Portugal, it's normal probably, because we are all a little bit selfish. <laughs> but. Uh, I think that we really need to focus in the, the countries with the higher level, highest level of levels of youth unemployment, and probably for two reasons. Uh, the first is more moral, uh, because the principle of solidarity that it's the basis of European Union, and one economic reason, because the biggest countries like Netherlands and like Germany also gains <laughs> with less youth unemployment in Portugal. Because, for example, one of the consequences of the crisis in Portugal was that the commercial balance is p positive now. And one of the reasons is because Portuguese people uh, is buying less cars and probably less German cars and probably less Italian cars like Mercedes, Audi, Ferrari and stuff like that. Uh, what, we, what I heard with Sofia in Portugal is that the, the youth in Portugal really thinks that the state, the Portuguese state needs to do something because uh, the reality is that for the youth in Portugal, European Union is like a very far organization and we really don't know what it is, the institutions and stuff like that. And we think that the Portuguese state needs to do something with the European Union, of course. Uh, but the, the sensation is that uh, we are creating something like a lost generation that has no hope. And most of the people, it's n just normal in Portugal. Okay, I'm in, the, in, I'm in the university, but in the end of the, of the graduation, I won't find a job. Uh, and people, especially in uh, areas like history, sociology, it's really hard to get, to get a job. Um, and the idea, and this leads to an idea that is uh, studying is not necessary and we are studying for nothing mm -hmm. uh, at the end uh, we can't reach nothing and just to, so to do, end, do you do you agree uh, uh, I agree 
talking based about on these <laughs> based yes yes I agree that uh, countries like Spain, Greece, and Portugal needs to be more uh, needs to get more attention uh, of about uh, European Union, and that's all. Okay. We can keep the discussion. Thank you. Um, who would like to respond? Would somebody at the panel would like to respond at this point? We've heard many different ideas, maybe even uh, an outline of the problem uh, uh, and the non-existent problem uh, from both different sides of, of Europe. Um, is there anybody who would take a vote? And maybe anybody who would make stand up? Could I add one more uh, very simple calculation as an argument? Uh, in this same ILO um, uh, report, in this same ILO report, um, it was calculated that 21 billion euros, if I'm correct, uh, were necessary to roll out the youth guarantee throughout the EU. There's 8 billion to be given out. So that naturally means that you need to concentrate the money to make it something worthwhile. Uh, and for another one, uh, a country like the Netherlands does still have money of its own to invest in its youth, uh, whereas Spain and Greece and Portugal really don't have that much to spare within their own public budget. So I completely agree that the money that is there should be focused on the countries that are worst hit not even actually on the regions that are worst hit, because if a region is within a country that is itself able to pay, there are also quite disadvantaged regions in Germany, I'd say Germany needs to take care of its own disadvantaged regions. It is only in the countries that really have nothing to spare themselves that uh, the money should, uh, should be targeted, according mm -hmm. to me. Um, if, is there somebody who would like to respond? Yeah, that's your question, yes. Well, I, I don't think there's anything that is given that uh, it should work that way for a couple of reasons. First of all, I think one thing might be that it could be differently, that it could be more effective to invest the money in certain places, not in others. Uh, and if we could sort of get more effect out of investing it for like youth, like unemployed people in the richer country, I don't think that necessarily would be a bad idea. Uh, and also, I think that it's not necessarily true to say that. Like even though we might want to benefit those who are like the weakest or, or however you want to define that, uh, I think there could be plenty of such people even within countries that themselves are necessarily doing so, so badly. So I think that like tackling youth unemployment is not necessarily an easy thing, and so given that countries that are doing relatively well are able to handle that, and the, the unemployed youth in those countries they also have a right to take part of that money. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's given necessarily that it should be going only to those countries. Okay. I can hear if you want to respond. <laughs> like to well, I have also, uh, of course, uh, spontaneous, you think, yes, it should go to the, the most worse off and the countries. Uh, but uh, if you think from out of an, an other geographic perspective and look into, for instance, in the, indeed, just where are the most in need, then it's not only in the countries, it's also in, in the ghettos, uh, in Paris or in, in Antwerp or Brussels or wherever. So, um, uh, indeed, you can say that um, uh, a government should take care of its own uh, disadvantaged and unemployed uh, young people, but what are the guarantees that they will do that? And secondly, um, what are the guarantees that, for instance, in Portugal, the government will invest in the most worse of? So, um, uh, I can imagine a policy in which you highlight the areas um, uh, in need across Europe, and this also for the future will give support also maybe cross-European uh, cooperation instead of only investing in the, in the countries. Thank you. May, may I then broadly ask, uh, go, going into this line, because there's, uh, we, we're hardly having the baby here, uh, um, uh, but uh, if we're advocating that, um, say, uh, the Germans and the Dutch amongst us, um, um, with uh, the lower percentages of, uh, uh, of youth employment, and as you say, there may be more exp expertise to be more effective in battling issues, um, Agreeing then to say, okay, then these countries need to take care of their own, um, but also, and that's what the, <coughs> the motion uh, in front of us says, also invest in other states. Do you think it, this is feasible, even desirable, um, uh, uh, to, um, to have them both say, hey, look to your own ghettos, look to your own, as far as they are there, um, uh, look to your own regions, um, but also invest in others, and why would you do that? Is José Miguel's example of a market uh, leveling itself out um, enough to 
I would, uh, I would first of all uh, congratulate Jose on the point that she, she made at the very beginning, which is that, that uh, also, also the countries with, which are which have the be best economic and employment performance at the moment, uh, like, like countries in, in the core of the European Union or the Eurozone, they also would benefit from the, from, from redu reducing youth unemployment in, in, the, in, the, in the countries which suffer from the highest levels. I think this is a very important point. And it is, it is therefore in, in, in their self-interest to, 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 to tackle the problem. It is in the collective interest of, of the European Union, and especially of the countries which committed themselves to having a, a single currency, to tackle the, the key employment and social problems. As you mentioned, if, if, there are, if there are hundreds of thousands of young unemployed in Southern Europe, they are not buying uh, products from, from the rest of the European single market, and, and everybody loses. So I think that's a very important point. I think we also all, all broadly agree that, yes, we, the attention and support needs to be concentrated there where the, where the problem is biggest. Somewhere it's, it's, it's the whole member state is in trouble, Spain, Greece, Southern, somewhere it's, uh, somewhere it's more graduated. Northern Portugal has a less of a trouble than Southern Portugal. Somewhere it's, 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 the discrepancies are even larger. In, in, in the UK you have, you have, for example, inner London, which, which, is a, which, is, which is a high, which is a lot of, uh, which is a lot of youth unemployment. You have Merseyside, the Liverpool area, and Manchester, there is also a lot of youth unemployment there. In other regions, uh, it's, it's less of a problem. And then, you, even, you have, you have even really micro regions, like, like the outskirts of Paris, which, which, uh, which you won't mention. So of course, uh, the level of where you have to tackle the problem is uh, it's, it's a bit difficult to, to define ac across, across the continent. Somewhere it's the whole country is burning, somewhere it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a region that is burning, somewhere it's a, it's a sub-region that is burning. So if we consider what actually happened when, uh, when the European Council agreed that on, on allocating 6 billion of, of funding, actually 3 new billion and 3 billion from old money, to, allocate, to, to, to target the problem of youth unemployment, they, they decided to allocate it on a regional basis. For regions where, where the youth unemployment rate exceeds 25%, uh, mm. which, uh, which, in, which this, is, this, is, this, is, this is in the end how the money was allocated. I think it's a sensible, sensible method. There were, of course, many discussions on whether, whether the threshold should go a bit up, a bit down. Of course, countries, countries, there are countries like Spain or Greece where every single region qualifies practically. So there, you got the whole country covered through this criterion. In some other countries, like like the UK, for example, you get, you get five regions out of uh, out of dozens of regions that qualify, but they also receive some support. So I think um, somehow we, with, with, with of course some some flexibility in built in, in the mechanism, we arrive at a solution where the money actually goes to those places. Where, where, where support is most needed. Um. Would you do that? Yeah, which, yeah, no, I, I think uh, also the UK should be uh, paying itself. We, of course, try to, uh, to make all countries invest. Um, this is also why uh, the Youth Guarantee was, uh, was launched, and all member states have committed to this. It is not a very firm commitment because there's no sanction if they don't do it. But at least every single member state has said we will introduce the youth guarantee. Uh, then it comes to the matter of who pays for the introduction of it. And there are some countries that cannot pay for that themselves, and there's countries that can. Um, sorry, well, in the, in the end, it, it was regionally divided, which is a fairly normal way of dividing European funds. Uh, but yeah, if, if it had been up to me, it would be more of a national thing because yes, the UK can pay for its own youth guarantee and no, Greece cannot. Um, uh, and just one reaction, uh, if you say, well, uh, but what if a member state does not pay for it? But then you, you uh, reach a very core issue of the EU. The EU is not there to compensate for wrong choices of national governments. Um, if governments make uh, wrong choices, then basically um, they need to be voted out of office in the next elections. <coughs> uh, but you, yeah, it, it, it sort of goes against the whole way that politics is organized within the EU. If you say, well, we need to bypass national governments uh, if they don't make the right choices and uh, organize it in a European way, we need to organize Europeanly what needs to be organized Europeanly and just um, uh, take decisions at the level at which they should be taken to 
in the end benefit the whole because uh, that I think is a very important point. Uh, we're all in the ship together. I also said at one point, well, it's like um, uh, some of the countries on one side of the boat are saying to some others, your side of the boat is sinking. Uh, and uh, but yeah, we are all in the same boat together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I actually would you stand up, please? Yeah. Hey, okay. Um, I think that's basically part of the problem. Yes. Some people want to leave the boat, um, namely the UK wants to leave the boat, and they are voting on actually the very question if they want to leave the boat. And UKIP is getting stronger and stronger. We can assume that Eurosceptic parties will have in the next election over 20%. If it's getting worse, then maybe close to 30 And if we're talking about that, then public perception is important. And then the opinion of the northeast of the UK does matter. And if we did then say, yeah, some specific countries get the money from other countries, it's way harder to justify it to the true Finns, to the UKIPs in the world, why we are giving that. If we have actually something that at least is perceived as a neutral threshold of unemployment, then you can argue we have this problem here, we have this problem in various states. It doesn't really matter if it's more effective or not, but it's perceived as more just. And sometimes if things are perceived as more just, then it's easy, more easily justifiable for pro-European parties. Then we can say this is a whole European thing and not just a European thing to help those actually who are partly responsible for what happened. Mm -hmm. But you, uh, for example, you were saying that it's not the uh, idea of the European Union to bail out uh, countries who actually make mistakes, but that's how it's perceived in some countries. It doesn't really matter if it's true, but it's perceived as this. And if we are talking about the idea that Europe is funded on solidarity. For most of the people, that doesn't, uh, it's not true. It, firstly, it wasn't funded on solidarity, it was funded on actually trade. Yes. Um, and we believe at the end of the day that for some people, so solidarity doesn't matter. It more matters that you can sell stuff, which I take as an argument. But I could sell stuff in the UK <laughs> as well, right? Just, I, I never said that um, the EU is not there to be like countries that made mistakes. It, it, it has and mistakes. it should. But um, uh, if there is a government, well, if, if the Dutch government, for instance, chooses uh, within its policy choices not to invest in alleviating youth unemployment, then, yeah, that is a choice of a democratically elected uh, government. And... Um, they should really be voted out of office in the next uh, elections. I mean, that is the way to, to handle that. Uh, that's something entirely different than uh, a country that makes mistakes, um, cooks the books, um, and ends up mm -hmm. bankrupt. Then, uh, sure, yeah, that's, uh, that's something we need to, to salvage. Thank you. May I visit you for before closing statements of Mr. Sauri, or would you like to interrupt? That's before? fine. Yes? Let's remember that, that uh, okay, youth employment, youth guarantee, these are matters of employment policy. If you look at the treaty, this is something where the, where the EU cannot harmonize measures, so it, it cannot, it cannot, we cannot, we could not possibly prescribe at the EU level uh, the youth guarantee as in, in, the, in the form of a regulation directive. It's, it's a matter of, it's a, it's a recommendation, and it's, it's something that, uh, it's a matter of coordinated employment policy. The member states all agreed on the recommendation, which I by the print, printed on handouts, and it's, I think it's somewhere in the back of the room, you can have a look at it, it's only six pages. And they agreed on, the, on this recommendation. Hey, this is a, this is something that we all should do, and if we all do it, it will actually benefit uh, all of us uh, together. And uh, I, I agree that, that certainly a government which, which which decides not to care at all about its, its young unemployed should be voted out of office. But uh, it's also important that when the minister for uh, for labor and social affairs, minister of employment, comes to Brussels uh, for for the council meeting uh, a couple of times per year, that he's he or she is facing some peer pressure. From the, from the other countries saying, why aren't you putting in place the youth guarantee, or why aren't you doing anything at all, or why are you doing just, just very, very modest, why are you taking just very modest steps in this respect? Why are you, why are you letting, letting uh, your young people down, but why are you letting, letting uh, everybody else in, in the single market down? Because you are really, really undermining the, the long-term potential of, of the whole single market and, and of the Eurozone in particular by failing to do your homework on the youth guarantee. Some interesting questions also that may come back uh, soon in the next motion. And uh, Mathieu, may I ask you to, yeah, to close the debate? And uh, that's a bit frustrating because in okay. the end <laughs> the, the debate has been sparked off a bit lately yes. with this uh, final uh, quotation of, uh, of Mrs. Collinson.
uh, the, EU, the EU is not here to compensate wrong decisions made at the, at the national level. Well, I would say that the EU is here to, to support and to, to help the change within the countries and uh, instead of giving the last push to the UK out of the boat, we should be here to provide the incentives for a real, a genuine change uh, at the EU level because as Lukas just said, the consequences of youth employment in the countries are replicated everywhere in Europe. So that's why, that's why we should tackle this issue comprehensively and um, Europe-wide. One last thing uh, that I would like to, to say about the youth guarantee, and, and maybe that's uh, quite um, my answer to the question, is that the youth guarantee is not only about supporting youth employment, it's also about prevention of youth unemployment. Um, and when you look at the, at, the, at the countries, it's not only a region's divide, it's also a divide within their own regions because you've got some specific target groups that are much more affected than the rest. One that is quite obvious for everyone is the Roma people, of course. Also, you've got the needs. We didn't tackle this issue, and that's, uh, I hope that it will, it will come up uh, a bit later on, but the needs are particularly affected. One of the solutions that could be provided within in the frame of the EU funds would be the specific operational programs uh, in ESF in all regions. And of course, myself working in the, uh, in the Youth and Employment Unit, I hope I hope that we, we will have as many uh, specific operational programs all over Europe as possible. And, um, and I will stop here because uh, I think that's, uh, that's Good. This was uh, our first motion. Okay. I think we're warm. Yeah. I think we're getting into it. Thank you very much. Uh, let me give the floor to my colleague Anna uh, to guide you through the second motion. We know unemployment uh, is a big issue among many Europeans and many young Europeans. We know that this problem will not easily be solved. So, in my opinion, it's really important that they invest in the youth because we are most most likely the future of the whole European Union. All right. So many of you indicated that when we are both, I am going to move here. Uh, when we are giving uh, aid to uh, young people who cannot find a job easily uh, and when we uh, help them through the youth initiative or youth guarantee, we should focus on things that actually directly serve society rather than just, just give them a job in a company uh, or an internship in a company or have them uh, build up work experience in some way. Uh, and that is the second motion of this debate and I would like to invite uh, Ms. Cornelison to uh, give a statement about this motion? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, must, I must admit that I didn't entirely understand the motion. Um, uh, is it that uh, it should be yeah, social services that carry out the projects and uh, so that it's, it's more or less uh, government-led or authorities-led? Uh, or is something else meant? Um, the, the way I interpreted it, um, is that it would be uh, government-led uh, programs that are, um, I need to move, I will move. Yeah, you need, you can we pull All right. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, but now I'm blocking the banner. <laughs> 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 All right. So anyway, um, um, the idea is that it's government-led projects that would be, for example, helping uh, in areas of, uh, that the government needs to have happen anyway. So for example, say in a nursing home where it's very useful work, or say cleaning the streets. I'm, I'm giving very easy examples now, but obviously oh, there are more okay. uh, jobs available. So but it would it's, definitely it's more be about the, 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 the social character of the jobs. Yeah. The, the, the direct benefit to society uh, okay. kind mm -hmm. of jobs, but definitely government-led as well. To, 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 help, uh, to help understand, um, uh, Kids in, in, in the, the training sessions came up with ideas like um, making a European civil service army. Um, uh, uh, so it's not only on the government, the national government level, but maybe also even on the EU level. It was a very broad way of describing, uh, hey, um, let's put in some extra infrastructural projects, some healthcare issues, um, um, mm. and, and do it in... Um, uh, <laughs> okay. Oh, actually, I live in, uh, in Amsterdam in, uh, in the weekends. There's uh, the Amsterdam Forest, it's called, and that was built in 1929, uh, 24, I think, uh, 
um, at the very, very beginning of, of the crisis. And um, that was such a project in which a lot of unemployed people were put to work building this forest. It's a lovely forest. Um, well, on a, on, a, on a small scale, I, I wouldn't think that perhaps uh, every, every city needs its own forest built by young people would go a bit too far. Um, the youth guarantee, uh, yeah, it, it's something that all countries are committed to. They should take all kinds of actions. And there is no holy grail of solving youth unemployment. There is no one solution that will work. I think that, uh, well, the one solution that will work is actually uh, getting out of the crisis. Mm. Because, uh, you, yeah, I, I, I do want to make this point that it is all about um, having an economic crisis and a shortage of jobs in general. So the only real solution is getting out of the crisis and having the economy uh, start growing again and fostering jobs again. Um, but uh, barring that, and this is actually this is what he's working on as well, trying to make uh, social governance or economic governance more social. Because for now, with countries only trying to get under the three percent uh, budget deficit and the sixty percent state debt, um, they're uh, reforming in a way that might be good for the financial figures, but that uh, does uh, uh, make poverty rise and that does make <coughs> unemployment rise even further. Um, and if it were up to me, then um, levels of, of unemployment and poverty would be as binding as would the 3% and the 60%. But, so that is the, the, the bigger framework within which you should see the battle against youth and unemployment. unemployment. Um, for the youth uh, guarantee, of course, is a framework that needs to be filled in with uh, activities. And <clears throat> I think that it would be brilliant to have a lot of activities together with uh, uh, companies, with businesses, um, to have, uh, uh, for instance, business startup uh, possibilities, uh, helping young people get credit uh, with banks to start up their own businesses and create their own jobs that way. Um, uh, having there's there's now in the Netherlands this project of uh, the starter scholarship where you get uh, the chance to work for half a year and get a scholarship, so it's cheap for the employer, um, but you, you gain experience and you also gain sort of a little bit of, of money to be able to do a course or get a certificate or whatever after. This has become hugely popular uh, in the Netherlands in a very short time. I think there's about 200 municipalities participating now. Mm. Um, there's all kinds of wonderful things sprouting up throughout uh, the EU. I love the Danish job patrol where young people go by uh, employer, employers who employ young people to do peer interviews with uh, young people to see whether their uh, employee rights are being respected. Mm -hmm. And um, this works wonders. And I thought at first it would be sort of a symbolic uh, project, but they visited a hundred thousand companies this mm. summer, so it's not a small thing at all. Um, there's, there's examples of uh, government-led projects, there's examples of business projects, um, there's uh, uh, projects that are being done by banks, and I think we need all of them to also be able to cater for very different groups uh, of young people with different uh, education levels. Uh, different places where they live, different areas, uh, and uh, <coughs> so it, it needs to be coming from a multitude of, of different options. So, in in general, social service projects are not should not be the main focus of such a youth no. guarantee because of the reasons you gave about diversity. Now, I'd like to ask the two. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I did notice where you were. Um, the two people who prepared this motion, Johan and Madeline, I don't know who's starting. I'm starting. All right, uh, please rise. <laughs> um, well, we have certain aspects to that motion, and some were brought up already by you. But first aspect is that we had a problem with the skill match uh, or mismatch. 
what we discussed earlier today. So we have actually a demand of ICT jobs, white jobs, green jobs, and then we propose um, social services, and then we ask the question, is that the right area to, to in incentivize um, more jobs? So we have the first problem of that, because um, it's a question, do we, like, in terms of getting out of the crisis and, you know, fostering economy of rice, is that the right area, is that the right field of where the, where's the most potential for the economic, um, for, for the economy to, to rise again? So that was the first problem we had with that issue. The second one is basically the decline of the prestige and also the value of earnings in that position. Because I, I mean, we were told that we should present, you know, some. Um, aspects of our own country, and um, I'm from Germany and of the, the Austrian society. So what happened basically in Germany when we implemented Hard Sphere like a couple years ago, that we got into those social services and unemployed people were asked to work very cheaply in those areas. So like public gardening, um, you know, doing some. Um, working in hospitals and stuff like that. So first of all, those jobs got you know less prestige all of a sudden were not paid very well, was basically paid by the state, just and not really seen as a real job because mm -hmm. we were still unemployed but working. So basically like well, like government's life. Um, <laughs> and so this is what, what which led to a big social gap and a big class society. So now all of a sudden we have like uh, this, this class of people who have like a low income jobs and now a class of people which are very well, you know, earn jobs. And I don't think that's the goal what the, United, uh, the European Union wants to achieve. So that's a big fear I see with that issue. and. I, I know it's a question of how is it implemented, but that would be my concern. If we implement something like that, that should be well-paid jobs, and they would still have to be recognized as real jobs and get paid as a normal job and not one euro jobs. All right. Um, I, um, do you have like 20 seconds more or a whole I minute have, more? Yeah, um, 20 <laughs> seconds more. Then also the problem is um, the voluntarily uh, social year, which is actually um, implementation, I would see that actually quite suitable. Because, um, for example, in Germany we just recently voted against uh, um, military duty and when male um, young people said, okay, we don't want to do the military service, I'm going to do social service. So those were a lot of jobs, like in terms of hospitals and, and kindergartens. Those jobs fell apart with that new policy. Those are perfectly mm -hmm. jobs which mm -hmm. are now open as a voluntary year to say, okay, we have still the demand for those jobs, and this would be a good implementation to, to offer a, a good education, but implemented with like an educational feel to it so that they actually learn something valuable to that. Um, to that job and not just or use as slaves because that's you know the whole idea that those people get work experience mm -hmm. and right. just 15 more seconds <laughs> yeah. I promise I mean we did the pupils um, oh, we debated a lot with pupils and I promised them to tell them what they thought about the whole um, unemployment situation and because the biggest um, solution they saw definitely in an apprenticeship for the whole European Union not just Austria and Germany and also um, startups, and you, uh, Miss um, Cornelison, was already talking about. So okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> so again, the focus on uh, let's diversify, let's not devalue certain jobs by making them cheap and available uh, through almost forced labor or fake forced labor. Uh, Johan, would you like to add something to that? Yeah. Um, so uh, in. A lot of the debate we focused uh, when we spoke about these issues in Sweden, the way to solve it, we talked a lot about education, and sort of like government going in and, and making sure that people were well educated for the jobs uh, that sort of were in, uh, where they demand people. Um, so I just want to address this mismatch point because what one of the main concerns with allowing the sort of incentives given to companies to hire interns and that kind of thing is the, is the concern for exploitation, and that was brought up and it's been brought up a lot in the debates in Sweden. Um, and, it, it's, and that's why we are more in favor of having sort of government-led programs. Um, 
And we believe that government programs can be good in itself, and I'll, and I'll get to that. But the point about exploitation here is that if you're doing it for the government, the government can create a job specifically for that. Like they can say, all right, we'll have extra people in this sector, which will be filled by these, these vacancies. But in the private sector, you can't as easily see that. For example, in the private sector, they might fill jobs that already exist, but they just take cheap labor to fill them. And so instead of having, you know, they'll, they'll fire the person paid a decent salary and then take in with, with the aid of government to just, uh, you know, fill their profit line. And that has been one of the major arguing points in Sweden. And we also believe that the reason this is, the problem with this is that there is no real accountants here. It's hard to check up on companies to see if they're doing this or if they're actually employing more people, employing more youths. Uh, and also, based on this, there's also the idea of perception. Because a lot of people see that the financial crisis isn't necessarily something that harms everyone, but in fact something that benefits you know, the big corporations that are making a lot of money now that, the, for example, employment is cheap. This is a perception that is quite harmful and that is not good to have. Uh, and we believe that any sort of uh, idea that these incentivized programs help the sort of corporations that some people feel ha cause the crisis or cause this harm, we believe that that is also a harmful image of the program in itself. Um, we believe that instead if you focus on, well, if you focus on government programs, you can fill out sectors that have been cut down, for example, in healthcare in these areas. But also in general, when you cut down programs, you usually don't cut down the skilled people. Like if you cut down in, on with how much you spend on police force, you don't cut down the amount of police officers, you just cut down, for example, administrative personnel and that stuff, and have police officers write more reports. And these kind of unskilled laborers have to, they have to do that as well. We believe that necessarily the prestige of these jobs don't emanate from the amount of pay you get, but from they can get it from like the service to society. So not necessarily planning for us and giving leaves, but there could be jobs that are not required too much skill, but that still sort of puts you in there and puts you uh, sort of in a working environment that gives you that type of education that sort of hands down skills to get you a job in the future. But if you necessarily need, and I'm summarizing now, if you, and that's to fill out those types of jobs. The other types of jobs we want to fill when it comes to sort of ICT, green jobs, that the role of that was clearly uh, in, when we debated in Sweden was do it through education and that is also a government run. So that's how we say that the, the services should mainly be through social state run government projects. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Would you want to respond? Would okay. anyone else want to respond? Uh, Brilliant uh, argumentation. Yeah. <laughs> um, really good. Yeah. He whispered in my ears, she's ready to debate in the European Parliament now. Yeah. <laughs> and I agree. Um, yes, no, some very, very um, uh, good arguments have been mentioned. I think um, definitely the, the um, danger of replacement is a very, very valid one. Uh, both um, uh, in, the, in the German example, I think we have that in the Netherlands as well, where um, uh, municipal gardeners were uh, let go because of cuts in, uh, in, in the budget. Um, and then these, these same unemployed municipal gardeners were sort of forced to do the jobs they once did uh, in return for getting their benefits, which, I mean, it's it just so horrible. Um, so that uh, definitely should be prevented. I'm very happy to, uh, to know that the European Commission uh, uh, will be coming out with a framework for apprenticeships to try to at least uh, have some safeguard against exploitation of young people because, yeah, with so many people just wanting a job uh, and begging for one, it is so easy to exploit them, especially people who don't have that much experience negotiating in the labour market. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm also very happy to hear that Germany will finally, finally have a minimum wage at some point. Uh, so that these, these mini jobs of two and a half euros an hour will be passed. Uh, I mean, that is still white slavery exploitation. So uh, before we move on to you, I would like to get the floor to you. I'm Miguel from my Europe, and I would like to say I'm against this motion. Because for me it means that it's one size fits all. You find an uh, easy solution for the government. You even like cover some of your problems. Of uh, you can even uh, build the more roads cheaply. And at the same time, you are not paying attention to the real needs of every individual. And for me, the youth guarantee will only work if it pays attention to the individual needs of everyone. Because it's not the same. I mean, they are all 
unemployment, un unemployed people, but it's not the same. Every uh, people, if it's finished uh, higher education, it just came out of secondary education. So it should be uh, more focused in case by case. And uh, then, of course, you cannot cover all with social service projects because it will mean, of course, you would give out a job for six months, and then after that, what's come? What if you are uh, an engineer and you have been doing garden in the city after six months, you are not going to continue that. You will start looking again for a job in a field. So uh, for me, these social service projects can be a temporary solution and I, I don't see the youth guarantee as something like that, but as something that really is the first step to become a real uh, employed person in the, in the job market for a long time. So we shouldn't waste it on this particular uh, event? Oh, okay. <laughs> Just a short introduction. It's um, for the yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we do realize that there's... Okay, so this is my time. Yeah. Uh, oh, 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 well, you don't get to wrap it up then. But you no, know, no, no, but I'm, I'm sure that the other people will be more than capable of doing so. Uh, thank you so much. That was very inspiring. And, um, it, yeah, I'm, I wish you very good luck with your projects. Uh, and, um, yeah, hope that uh, the youth guarantee and all the initiatives will be put to very, very good use in the yeah. <laughs> Thank um, you. I'm, I'm then going to Um, thank you also uh, on our behalf for the little of my students. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's such a shame, Kathleen, this is very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe um, until next time, we're going to have them also. Oh, yeah. 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 We can all go to the forest. Then. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Just getting my phone out of the electricity here. <laughs> okay, thank you. Bye. 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 All right, uh, Yvonne. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a pity that she's not there anymore. She was our reference point, but anyway. Uh, no, I, I believe indeed, uh, I agree, uh, of course, of not of course, but uh, that if it happens, the social service project needs to be empowered for uh, the people who are participating uh, in it. And also, of course, um, uh, yeah, that they grow through it, that's my belief. But having said that, I think it's a very um, short-term solution. And if we focus on the motion, I'm actually especially focusing on the word mainly. And I think this is not the main job of the, the youth guarantee uh, program, I believe. And then I talk about um, uh, the Netherlands in particular, but I think in every country they do the, to have their uh, homework and figuring out how are we coordinating, actually, um, uh, the prevention of the people entering into a uh, youth unemployment situation? In our country, for instance, there are totally two split domains, the, the social services, the labor market, and the educational sector. And it is absolutely shocking how this is mismatching each other. Just give one example. Uh, we have to, so what I told you, we have the debate with these kids who are unemployed, dropped out from uh, a lower educational school. Why? Because they have to find their own internship. And if they don't have an internship mm. found, then they cannot get their exam. So that, that's in the Netherlands. Uh, it's the same in France. The same in France. Well, so, so I think there's the first start to, to figure out how can you at least help these young kids and, um, uh, and massively have a complaint about this, that at least they get a starter's qualification. Because then you come to the second point, if they don't have a diploma, nobody is seeing them. They are lost. But they have a lot of competence. So there are many other ways and policies to be implemented, uh, giving even those who don't have um, a starter's qualification opportunities on the labor market. So I wouldn't say immediately talking about social service programs. All right. And uh, I, will, I will give you a chance to wrap up this debate as well, so you have to <laughs> wrap up too. But before that, I'd like to see if there's anyone who want, would want to make a, a brief statement. Um, and if not, then we're moving to you, and you get to wrap up this debate. Um, the one to deal with the closing procedure of the revolution. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, these two. Just three points shortly. First one is, um, I completely agree with the point raised by, uh, by Johan. Um, the problem with the private sector is the, the, the vacancy that are filled in with, um, um, I mean, with cheap labor force, and that's something that is really a big concern for the Commission. That's why 
the European Alliance has been launched, one apprenticeship. That's why the Q, um, the QFT, the Quality Framework for Traineeships, has been has been enacted too. And uh, okay. this the is Commission will make a proposal tomorrow. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what I was about to say. This is the good news of the day. We just uh, we just uh, got to know that. It has been uh, accepted by uh, within the internal regulation <coughs> process, but the problem is that if you put on the one hand the private sector and on the other hand the, the public sector, it's also a huge resources for youth employment that you are just uh, avoiding. For instance, just in the frame of the European Alliance for Apprenticeship, we got Nestlé that has committed to create more than 10,000 apprenticeships by the end of 2015, and. Um, another good um, consequence of that is like by describing this measure to the supply chain then many of the uh, of the actors in the supply chain committed to create I don't know a hundred um, apprenticeship places here to to a hundred here and but at the end of the day you can you can end up with 30,000 um, ap new apprenticeship places by the end of 2015 which is something very very important and valuable to to fight youth unemployment. Second thing, very quickly, uh, in the and I think that that will give the answer to this question, my answer at least, is the youth guarantee. It's aimed at short-term measures, of course, but of, of um, it's it's also the um, it's also aiming at structural reforms of the labour market and the education system, and that's why we should rest upon uh, the dual le learning system that is working well in Austria and Germany, and that's. And that with the in the framework of the European Alliance, for instance, as a platform, we should exchange practices to say, look, we're facing the same problem in this region. Why don't you do that and that and that? Because it worked out to to get more apprenticeship and to increase and to improve the um, the image of, of apprenticeship. Um, last thing, very important to echo the second point, is <coughs> about the skills mismatch. To make sure that all the um, all the vacancies are filled in, and to make sure that we uh, we have good quality apprenticeship and traineeship, you need learning outcomes that has been agreed upon at the beginning of the of the ap apprenticeship or the training. Learning outcomes, that's the key, and then that's the best way to address the, the skills mismatch. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think we can safely conclude that there will be no European Civil Service Army after this debate. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, with that, I'd like to move on to the next motion. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, this is uh, certainly interesting, and some of the next points for the next motion already came to the table. Um, but let me force bore you with a small anecdote. Um, the sessions, training sessions, um, they have been not only about uh, youth employment issues and gathering uh, uh, youth opinions, uh, but obviously they've also been a small, very general press course about the EU. And then we asked youth, they asked youth, um, how they would effectively lobby the EU. Um, one of uh, the most interesting feedback that we got next to all the press bulletins, all the uh, websites and um, uh, statements that would be written uh, to Brussels uh, was to go to Brussels, lock President Schulz up uh, in a, a bathroom uh, until he wanted to hear what they had to say. Um, we're not going to do that today, so um, uh, following that anecdote, um, let's go to, to the third motion. I think there are different kinds of things which should be done, like for example, we should invest in the working experience of people. Youth guarantee funding should be accompanied by strict rules and regulations in the market to minimize potential negative economic effects caused by subsidies. Um, a long motion that was inspired by um, two different um, <coughs> two different ideas on the table. Um, one very loud argument for experience, as we were just closing the second motion on that note. Please provide us the opportunity for experience and we have an opportunity in the labour market. On the other hand, what are you going to do with uh, issues of exploitation, possible um, uh, uh, unevenness in labour markets? Um, Mr. Vasily, you've prepared an opening statement here. Give it a floor. Oh. It very, it very much links to, to, the, to the previous motion and to the, to, the, to the question whether we could possibly employ all the young unemployed in social services or whether we could, we could possibly all employ them in ICT jobs or, or what to do with them. I think what we need to realize is that the, the youth guarantee is an investment. It's, it's something that, that uh, 
governments need, need, need to do and they, they, need, they need to manage it at, at their national level and in the end they, it also needs to be it needs to be needs to be implemented with the involvement of the regional and, and, and local authorities but it's an investment and they need they need to allocate uh, people to, to, the, to the right measures and they need to find the right means of support to, to, the, to the people depending on their needs so if, if you have a if you have a talented uh, software programmer who, who finished education but cannot find a job well you, do, you don't put him into in possibly in, into planting trees in, in a park you try to find him or her some some work which is relevant to, to, to their background so, so that they can they can further develop and there is there is a number of, of potential little measures that, that the governments or instruments that the governments can use they can use hiring subsidies yes they can finance trainings they can provide traineeship or apprenticeship grants they can they can provide grants for start for business startup so there is a number of them and uh, yes indeed they need they need to develop criteria at the national level or maybe at the regional level or at the city level on how exactly they are going to use the money that they have available to, to, to help the people in the best way and to, to avoid the negative effects like just throwing money where it's not needed and, and uh, you know, providing support where, where, where the people would have helped themselves. But certainly this is not something that, that we could fix at the EU level. So this is also why if you look at the council recommendation on the youth guarantee, you see that it, it lists a uh, number of possible measures that they mentioned. Hiring subsidies, uh, startup grants, financing of trainings, apprenticeship grants or traineeship grants. But it's uh, basically the cocktail needs, needs, to be, needs to be mixed at, at the national level or in, even, even maybe, maybe at, at lower levels where the actual support is provided so, so the job center or whatever is, is, is the main contact point for the, for the young, young job seeker should, uh, should be able to decide okay you need you need to be placed into a traineeship this, this, this will help you and we have, we have a company that, that, that uh, will have an opening for you while on the contrary another person will be maybe placed into, into, into a traineeship in, in, a, in a public public owned hospital so it's impossible to harmonize this at, at the EU level, certainly because the situation throughout, the, throughout Europe is so diverse. But, uh, but certainly the, whoever is involved in the implementation of the youth guarantee, starting from the national ministry to the regional government or to, to, the, to the municipal council or the local job center, they need to, they need to of course, uh, think about how to maximize the return on investment and, and what, what exact instrument to, to use towards uh, every young person that comes to ask for their help. Okay, thank you. Thank you. May I give the floor to Aida in the to, to see whether she thinks and whether this is Yes. Uh, yes, you may. I can, I can. Yes. <laughs> well, we have a little bit of a problem uh, with the rules and regulations because um, when you put them on the companies, the companies um, you push the companies too much and they won't um, take any trainee, trainees anymore. Um, because when there are too much rules, it's too complicated. And, um, well, yeah, it's too complicated then. Um, and then it's about tra traineeships. Um, but these, these trainees work for 40 hours a week or more. Um, and they don't get the same loan as the, the employees. Um, so that's a big problem because only because they're younger and they're unexperienced they get a, a lower loan because but the traineeship is used to um, teach young people um, to get a job and how you do it um, so that's a pretty big problem um, and especially in the Netherlands you see now uh, that young people they have uh, a bachelor two master degrees um, and they hop from traineeship to traineeship because they're cheap companies. They're smart, cheap, um, easy to get because there are a lot of people um, who want tra traineeship. Um, so they're hopping from traineeship to traineeship and don't get any job because they're young and unexperienced. Um, so that's a little bit it. <laughs> Okay, so how are you going to prevent, for, um, how, how are you going to get people a real opportunity? Thank you, thank you, oh. thank you very much. I think maybe Emil would like to yes. uh, respond. Thank you very much. Uh, response or a continuation. Or a continuation. A parallel sign. Um, the idea of creating rules and regulations in a market to minimize the economic effects. Every time you create a traineeship, 
you are creating a crowding out effect. You are creating an opportunity for a company or whatever it is that is running this traineeship to not hire someone, to instead use a trainer, traineeship. And it has become, they have seen signs in many countries, soon among them, that companies have started to in institutionalize and make it into a sort of practice to hire trainees for this short period of time for menial tasks, menial labor, to get a cheaper labor market. And that's what we sort of discussed earlier. And I really think that if there are to be any type of rules, any type of regulations, they really need to promote actually hiring people for a job, not a traineeship. The young people deserve a job. The older generations fought long and hard to create a society where they sort of get a secure feeling in their own employment. It's a secure feeling to create something and to advance the position they're in. I think the youth deserve the same. Thank you very much. Is there uh, anyone who would like to respond to these <coughs> two uh, topics? Maybe you would like to directly respond to them? Yeah. It's uh, quiet. Is everybody still okay? <laughs> um, may I then ask you? Oh, yes, Gustavo. Uh, I just think that like one thing that needs to be kept in mind sometimes is that when you talk about creating jobs and like crowding out effects, I mean, jobs can be created quite easily in the sense that like it, it's not a static mass of jobs that are just there. So it depends a lot on like if, if you create an opportunity to have to employ someone, that job doesn't necessarily compete with existing jobs. That depends a lot on the nature of the jobs. And I guess linking to the previous discussion, one of the arguments you could bring to why you would want to have public sort of jobs instead of or private jobs in this kind of program is the fact that they definitely don't necessarily crowd out existing jobs if you don't want them to. Uh, if you hire people to do jobs, for example, that don't exist in the, in the present, like if we have, I don't know, things like changing the sheets more often in uh, homes for the elderly, but if that's you know, a job that doesn't exist currently, you only do it like every second day, it's not doing it every day or something, then that doesn't have to compete with the existing job because no one's doing it currently. So. Mm -hmm. I think there are ways of getting around these, these kind of problems. Okay. Well, flagging these kinds of problems, may I ask then, and, and from um, uh, the, the uh, uh, statement that you put forward that it's all on the national level and all about finding the right mix, um, um, to me uh, it sounds uh, like a, a pretty complicated, possibly very um, uh, bureaucratic way to figure out how to best interfere in what we want to be a labor market that's as free as possible um, and as efficient as possible. Um, how does how do these remarks um, balance with uh, just spending it on education and trying through better suitable education um, to uh, 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 get the experience through there so that paper qualifications um, are enough uh, to get that job at the right level without having to interfere with the job market? Is that a fair question? Look, the youth guarantee is, is a, is a, it's, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a simple, it's not a narrow measure. It's, it's, it's about creating a comprehensive scheme that catches everyone under 25, ensures that they get the labor market opportunity at least one, and it can be a job opportunity, it can, it can be a traineeship, it can be an apprenticeship, it can be a further learning experience, training course, what have you. Depending on the on the needs of the individual, and depending on also also what what, uh, what companies and NGOs or, or, or public sector institutions uh, in, in, in the area have been able, have been able to offer as, as, as placements. So you need you need to customize it actually for, for, for the individual concern. Just just read the, the, the first the paragraph one of the council recommendation. Ensure member states should ensure that all young people under the age of 25 years receive a good quality offer of employment, continued education, an apprenticeship or a traineeship within a period of four months of becoming unemployed or leaving formal education. There is there is no you know one size fits all like okay let's 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 move them all to to to, to, to plant the municipal park or let's 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 move them all into 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 centers for the elderly. To help there. No, if you can, you you would not be able to employ them there. First of all, you would not you would not uh, use the, the individual young people's uh, potential, and you would not, not help them develop their skills, and you would not really help them in, in improving the transition from school to work, which is what really matters. The youth guarantee is all about improving the transition from school mm -hmm. to work. Now, but it's 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 a it's a it's a very valid point that that uh, both of you guys from Sweden are making that uh, about the displacement of uh, of, uh, of regular jobs through through apprenticeship. Now tomorrow when the, when the European Commission puts forward the, the proposal again for a council recommendation, no legislation, right? Not not the directive, not the regulation, but council recommendation on the quality framework for traineeships, whereby we would we would try to create consensus in Europe what makes a good traineeship. One of the elements is 
A trainee ship must not displace a regular job. Uh, and this is something you will, we will not be able to take companies to court on that basis that, uh, and, and, and pursue, pursue any penalties for them. But you as a trainee or, or you trade unions within the company should be able to also invoke this and say, hey, this is some kind of a soft standard in Europe. A traineeship should traineeship should serve as a learning experience. It should not it should not be probably longer than, than six or similar number of months, and it should not displace an existing job. And if it, if if it does, then something is wrong in the company, and the company is abusing the training. So this is this is something. It's a, it will be a soft standard. It will not be legally enforceable, but it's nonetheless something that that, that, that people can invoke in the in the in the in the discussions within companies or also vis-à-vis -vis their national government. And if, 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 if governments are using public money in order to, to subsidize traineeships on a permanent basis and helping companies to, to basically bring down labor costs, if, if, if people consider this is not fair, then they really need to make their voice heard also vis-a-vis -vis the national government or vis-a-vis -vis whoever is deciding on the use of the money uh, and, and actually authorizing those subsidies at the, at the national, regional, local level. I can see somebody who may like this point. Yeah. Would you stand up, please? No. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the idea of a soft standard is pretty nice, but the problem with soft standards, uh, standards and the idea that they might be enforced to bargaining positions by trade unions, so actually that you assume that trade unions are strong enough and that tra trade unions are apparent everywhere. When we are talking especially about young unemployed, so then we are talking about interns. Interns are not present in most of the trading unions. So yeah. if you look at the people you want to represent, they have no representation. So it doesn't really work your idea of a perfect bargaining and then there is something wrong in the company. Yeah, there is something wrong in the company, but the actor who actually should change that is not willing to do it because he can still protect his own, um, yeah, his own constituents and the people who need to be protected are not. So a substandard won't really work won't really work for new jobs and it might even happen and we saw that in, in a couple of examples and we named all of them we named nearly all the countries in northern europe so probably a soft center is not enough right thank you Amy, to... yeah i uh, just the whole thing i'm saying there's something wrong with a company if their company gets an opportunity to hire a trainee to do the job of someone who would actually be hired they increase their profit and that's sort of the point of a company to produce profit so I don't really see how we want to encourage companies to do a morally correct choice because they are out after profit. That is the company's sort of job. But, but what, what can the government do? Let's say, let's say is the, the government should, should we, we might agree on the fact that the government sh should avoid providing a traineeship subsidy if, if, if it's just a traineeship and if, if, if there is no, no prospect of them staying on with the company. And if it's, it, so to the extent that the government provides hiring subsidies, it should be for people, people who, get a, who get an open-ended contract. Fair enough. But the general trend that companies tend to, tend to sometimes displace regular workers with trainees, this is, this is, uh, this is much more difficult for governments to tackle because, because this, this is simply, this simply results from the weakness of the labor market from high unemployment. And I agree, it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's horrible as an experience for free young people that they have to hop from, from one traineeship to, to another. Uh, but uh, but this, this is simply, you know, the, the labor market has unfortunately gone, gone uh, through a development where, where, the, where the, yeah, the bargaining position of young people in the labor market has become a lot weaker. Trade unions are also going through a generational change. They are, they are getting older and older. They are not, not always succeeding in, in actually, or they are sometimes maybe not open, I don't know, but, but definitely they are, they are not getting younger on average. And, and the issue of how to what extent they represent young people is, uh, is, is a real one. Depends on sectors. In some sectors, you practically don't have trade unions, like like uh, software development, I, ICT. You know, there are new sectors where, where, where traditions of social dialogue didn't, have not really developed yet. But okay, as the labor market changes, so 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 does so does society have to change. And, and uh, you guys, if if you are concerned about the exploitation of interns, you need to raise your voice with the company, with the municipality, with your national government. And hopefully the, the soft standard that, that the, the, the Commission is about to put forward and that hopefully the, the EU ministers of, of, uh, of employment are going to agree upon in a few months' time, hopefully this, 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 can, this can help your case. Unfortunately, I, we, we, might, we might all wish that there would be some a, a lot stricter uh, regulatory framework for, on, on traineeships, but it's not, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not going to happen because, because the business would fiercely oppose this. So, so the reality is that uh, that uh, 
we, need, we all need to kind of work together, unions, young people, businesses, governments, to try to, to improve the opportunities for young people, prevent exploitation, also explain to companies that it's not in their self-interest to, to exploit people and that they should try to play a more constructive role. And uh, hopefully we can move forward like that. Mm -hmm. um, one quick sentence for that, actually. Um, actually, it is not an issue for governments as well. Governments are using that as well. There are unpaid interns, plenty of them, mm -hmm. in governments <coughs> themselves. So if you are saying we should address governments, mm -hmm. they are part of the problem. Yeah. They are not willing to be the solution because actually they mm -hmm. benefit themselves. So it's, by really, example. it's really deeply entrenched. Yeah, we, we can talk about Germany, we can talk about the EU, uh, UN representations, we can talk about parts of the EU representations. So. When you're saying, yeah, we just should address them and it will go away, that's probably not going to happen because the bureaucracy itself has no incentive. May I ask uh, Mr. Paisley to, to uh, respond and, and to close with uh, um, uh, why? I mean, it's, it's, it's why this is still the best measure. No, I think my response will be very short. I, I think, to conclude, that having a quality framework for traineeships, although in the form of a soft standard, a council recommendation, is better than having no quality framework for traineeship at the EU level at all. Okay, so it will help. It will help a bit. It's 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 it's, it's a small step. Uh, if if the governments are are abusing young people also, and if if, if they are if they are kind of perpetuating the 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 nasty character of the, of the of the labor market that 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 is that that exists for young people, young people need to make their voice heard. Uh, go on the street if necessary. You guys need, 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 to, need to really make your voice heard, team up with the unions, fight partners, in, uh, question or really your, your members of parliament so, so that they, they put pressure on the government. You really need to stand for your interest because, because uh, otherwise nothing happens. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, may I have a hand for the third motion? To get all the way to the Anna Valkyrie, thank you. All right, and I think this spot is way better than the other spot as well, so I'm going to stand here as well. Now, the fourth motion, I think, is the most fun motion, or at least anyone who's been on an Erasmus program uh, probably will enjoy it, um, uh, will have enjoyed it. And this is exactly what we kind of want to uh, point at with this motion as well. Um, just like the Italians and the Greeks, uh, and the Spanish did in the early times of, of the European Union um, for the Greeks and the Spaniards when they joined. Uh, lots of them temporarily moved to other countries in Europe, worked there, filled up gaps that we had in, in Northern Europe, um, and when their economies started working better, or uh, when they just got fed up with our food, um, they moved back and uh, uh, went to enjoy the better development of their own countries. Now, this is a moment for the motion. Therefore, we all want the government or the European Union to take action. Jonas doesn't want to live in a tunnel. Davy doesn't want to live in a box. I don't want to live in a hut. So please, European Union, take action now. 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 ask uh, Yvonne to uh, give us some more perspective, or a different perspective than the Erasmus uh, people. Well, I don't know. Uh, well, if I read the motion, but to me it's not the most urgent solution and the most urgent uh, uh, priority of the youth guarantee, but it is a very good idea for a certain category of young people. When I, last year we had debate at Europe, a similar problem, but then for uh, secondary school uh, children of young people, and we interviewed a few of them about how do you perceive uh, Europe. And most of the, the young people we interviewed were from the gymnasia, so the, the higher level. And they, all of them, very enthusiastic. Oh, Europe is my, my country. I want to study in Europe. I want to travel in Europe. So yes, I believe Erasmus and all these kind of arrangements are beautiful and very important, especially because I think the next generation will maybe make more true from European Union than I mean, what is it now. I, I think these kinds of exchanges and that you work all across Europe, I think that would be wonderful. I, I really believe in that. But, and that's uh, my, my second layer of my reaction, I think it has also threats. And especially threats for those young people who don't have these easy opportunities. 
So if we do this, I think it's, it's very important that we, we first of all listen to, the, and it's a very, a very open door, but that we listen to this uh, group. And again, I talk about the ones who are living in the ghettos, uh, the, the very unemployed, poor young people in Portugal, in Greece, in Paris, etc. I'm not sure whether they are so happy with, with those arrangements for the, in the first place because they don't even culturally are bounded to or have the idea about these kind of projects because they are culturally more <coughs> focused on the families. Uh, they want to be with their families, etc. So I think for this reason, I think it's very important to know this group better than um, uh, up to this moment uh, the EU does, I think. I so sometimes have strongly the belief. Secondly, it can also be perceived as like, uh, okay, you have to go out of our country. And if I talk about unemployment, I think there's research in the UK. 50% of the young people who are unemployed are from different migrant backgrounds, mainly black people. So if you have something like, yeah, you have to go out of the country, it's beautiful, they feel like, okay, I have to go out of my country. Could be a uh, perception of it. But um, I think also, and that's the third layer of threat, that indeed, I think in, in Portugal, Greece, they would love to come to the Netherlands or, or like water, they will come to the places where they believe there is still work. But if you talk, talk about lower educational um, uh, jobs, there is not so much work in the Netherlands as well. So there will be accumulation of unemployed uh, young people from different areas of Europe. So I think these threats are very, uh, for me, are more heavier and more stronger because I believe that you, like people like you, you will find your way and I su should stimulate it definitely and I hope the, the EU is continuing with that. But I believe um, uh, that differentiation in this youth um, uh, guarantee program with a very strong emphasis on those who are in need and not only in the countries but also in the regions and sub-regions it's really important and I really believe that the EU, and you said, yeah, let your voice hear, but I believe that uh, youth participation is there in, across Europe. I don't think we have lack of it, but we have lack in Europe in, in the institutions. They need to change. They need to adapt to the demographic changes which we're going through in multicultural in, uh, uh, demography in, uh, in, in Europe. And I believe that skills and um, uh, of the policy makers needs to be increased to listen better to those who are in need and really listening long term and then giving due weight to their uh, needs. That's actually how I look into it. So sorry for this longer uh, time, but uh, I hope uh, I open the discussion. All right, so the uh, uh, young people, particularly those from disadvantaged backgrounds, are not going to be benefiting and might actually be starting to compete more heavily against each other uh, and that would probably not be a good thing. Um, if I'm summarizing very, very yeah. quickly, indeed. <laughs> uh, uh, Sophia, I wanted to start. Hi, I'm Sien. I'm going to talk from the, my, my knowledge of Portugal and pro probably some other countries with, high, with a high rate of unemployment. But I'm going to say that we are not that willing to move away from our country. In fact, our Prime Minister said to us that if we wanted some, uh, some progress in life, we should go away. And we made like this revolution against that statement because we want to help Portugal to get better. We want to stay in Portugal and we want to help the economy and we want to help us socially. And furthermore, we have this culture that is rather different from the northern, the northern countries. That's like we really value our tradition and our family. And we don't we would like to experience and to travel, but most of us really don't want to, to go away from our parents and our family and our friends. We are really cozy people. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, and so I don't think that we should stimulate, that we should uh, focus on stimulate the youth to look for uh, work out of borders, but yes, to stimulate their economy and their jobs in borders, in this, in this country, because it would, it would only benefit the youth the society and the country has a hold in their economical and social way. And yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, yeah, I actually beg to defer because I don't think it's about the people who want to stay in their country so desperately. Those people won't like just move out if they get a financial benefit or stimulus. The same, it's not about the people who already migrate because if they get a stimulus, well, they will migrate as well. They will, 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 probably won't make a change. But I think there's a group of people who 
it's just cut off from the chance to go to another country because this would mean like a big investment. It would mean, um, go, yeah, exactly, going away from a family. And even if there are no chances in the local community, those people very often just don't have the chance because the family says, well, no, this, like, you're going to cost us a hell lot of money and in the end you won't be able to send anything back, we just lose you, right? Um, and I think talking about this very specific interest group, it would be actually a very good policy to open up the borders for them as well because in the end, let's be fair, in many areas there is not a lot of educational opportunities, not a lot of job opportunities. When they go abroad, it means first of all that they get the chance to learn another language in many cases in Europe, that they show on their CV that they are flexible and ha happy to move around, which is a good um, predisposition for almost any company that is like multinational. And thirdly, they also show that they are able to adapt to another culture, which is in a very multinational multi -national Europe probably a big advantage. They might even acquire a new skill set if they go to a country where they get a new job set that is not available in their local community. And so, and I, I don't think that this very special interest group should be cut off from these very vital benefits for them um, and stay unemployed. Instead, you should focus on giving them a stimulus and the chance to move to other countries. Okay. Lastly, Krista? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm going to be sort of that economist and bring like a, a boring economist perspective on this. Because I think that the issue of um, labor migration, labor mobility, goes kind of beyond the issue of youth unemployment and poses more a fundamental question. because. Uh, essentially, if we're going to keep like a current level of economic integration and specifically keep things like a common currency, uh, I believe we're going to have to use like the common tool to uh, handle economic imbalances that we use in other currency areas, which is large scale migration. If you look at sort of uh, areas around in all kinds of countries, we have seen this. And if I so use an anecdotal example, my dad grew up like in an industrial town in, in northern Sweden. And when he was a kid, that was a pretty vibrant town. Lots of people lived there. They worked in you know, large Swedish export companies and so on. But today, that's a bit of a ghost town, which is dependent all across northern Sweden and across like areas of West Virginia and the US or northern England and so on, where lots and lots of people have moved out of there uh, because those are poor areas with poor economic conditions and so on. And that's probably something I believe we're going to have to see within sort of the Eurozone as well. Uh, it's probably unsustainable to have uh, large areas that are uh, on the lower economic level for so long, and what we're seeing as a sort of beginning trend now is that lots and lots of people are moving out of places like Greece and into other parts of Europe. And the question that then poses is that it seems, for example, that Sofia is not necessarily happy with this. Right? You could say that if you want the EU to become a pan European nation, that's not really a problem, people can live wherever. Uh, but if people actually do care about their country, they think that there's some benefit to Portuguese people actually having jobs and benefiting the Portuguese community that they live in, then that is a bit of a problem. I think so essentially that choice is a choice we're going to have to face regardless of how the youth are in the long term and it poses kind of a broader question about where which I actually want to take you a bit. Um, so mm -hmm. that's sort of the point I want to make. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Is there anyone who wants to add another uh, point to this you have? I mean, Yes. Uh, I just like to say that I I, I agree on a, on one level with with Mr. and the previous speakers, but I think you have to identify what kind of problem you want to solve. Because if the problem is that we have a like a dearth of uh, programmers in Stockholm, and we have a you know a surplus of programmers in Greece, and they and then we should stimulate it by allowing them to move there. But the problem is if there we have a lot of youths who are unemployed all over Europe, because they basically if there's a skills mis mismatch that is the same in most of Europe. Uh, or if it's because of uh, a lack of jobs in general in all of Europe, then it isn't that the jobs are magically in a different part of town, or that you know, if just the unemployed Greeks move to Germany and the unemployed Germans move to Greece, uh, then everything would work out. Uh, and then instead you'll, you'll focus on uh, trying to move the people who can get jobs. And those are the people that, uh, that everyone was speaking of, the, the people who are already privileged, who already might be able to get jobs in their local areas, but they can get better ones in, for example, in the, in, if they're in Greece, for example, in Northern Europe or something like that. And it's, it's fine with helping them, but the question is, is that the main focus? Mm -hmm. uh, which also leads to other aspects that, um, that Sophia brought up, a brain drain in the sense that these people will then move there to get those jobs that are better, but won't have uh, you know, the possibility of building up their own communities. And 
and the question is where should we put our focus? Mm -hmm. Is it in allowing them to transfer or is it allow or is it on the focus on the regional development? All right. Yeah, I will uh, as, as set aside with them because I mean I personally I am very mobile. I have lived in several countries but I have also seen the experience of people who didn't want to move and they had to move. And that, that's not an easy that, that's not an easy thing and if you stimulate youth to look for war beyond national borders. It should be done with a lot of preparation in advance. It should be done with being an option and not an, a, a the only option, because if it's the only option and then you arrive to a country with a different culture, with a different uh, society, you are alone, it, it's very, very hard. So it should be, for some people, the last option. And actually, it is the last option. And when they move, it's because they don't have any other option and they, that doesn't help. So either you, you prepare them very well in advance when you go, and then I don't know if in the youth guarantee is, is this uh, preparation included, but I don't think so. Or you should not stimulate people to do something that they don't want to do, because in the end that will cause a lot of frustration, and in all the benefits of studying or living abroad will not be there in the end, because when they finish their kind of job, they will try to come back as soon as possible, and then maybe they will not bring the best uh, European feeling or, or the best experience from there. All right, uh, Yvonne, do you want to respond now or do you want to... No, take I, I can... Uh, All right. maybe ask uh, you... you would. Oh, some, some very good points uh, that, that, that you have all made. Uh, particularly the, the point on the, on the Eurozone and the linking the issue of labor mobility with the dynamics of, of, in, in the common currency area. And I think you, you, are, you were referring there to, to the Vermont theory of optimum currency areas. And what, what, what does it make, um, you know, what, what does, what does a, a group of countries need if they want to have a common currency? The theory has been teaching us that they would need a high level of labor mobility, or at least they would, they would need to have synchronized economic shocks so, so that, so that the, the same interest rate kind of really fits them all. And if, if they don't have that, they should have common budget in order to smooth the differences. And uh, when one country is here, one country is here, and the, the, common interest rate is here, it doesn't really work, you would need to really have some fiscal transfers between countries in order to, 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 to reduce the imbalances. And this, this has of course been a very big taboo uh, in, uh, at, the, at the European Union level for a long time when, when, when the monetary union has been designed and reformed. So the issue of, of uh, many people say that you can, you, can, you, you can just rely on labor mobility, people will move from the, from, the, from the struggling countries somewhere else and it's going to all work fine and you reduce unemployment. This is a very simplified and rosy, rosy view of things. Uh, people often tend to forget that, that, that uh, in the US, which is also a very diverse country uh, with, with 50 states having a single currency, they also have a big federal budget to the tune of 20% GDP. But okay, this, 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 this is already a much, uh, much different debate. What I would like to stress is that uh, in the EU, labor mobility, free movement of workers is a right. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's something that uh, if you if you want to move and uh, you, should, you, you you have the right to do so. So so a Portuguese person has does have the right to move to the UK or to Italy or to Romania or wherever to find a job and, and, and to work there. Uh, but but uh, it should not be it should not be forced. It should not be forced uh, politically. It should not be forced economically. And maybe maybe let me quote you. Let me quote you from the Youth Guarantee Recommendation again. Paragraph 18. Member states should promote labor mobility. So not to force, not stimulate. Mm -hmm. Promote. Promote labor mobility by making young people aware of job offers, traineeships and apprenticeships, and available support in different areas and regions and countries. For example, through services and schemes which encourage the people to move and work within the union. So all cross-border possibilities. Ensure that adequate support is available to help young people who find work in another area or another member state so that you help them adapt to their new work environment. The EU, so it's all about, I think, the, the group that you, you were talking about, not those who, who really want to stay or those who have already moved, you know, but, but really helping those who would like to move, who would be willing to move, but, but maybe don't have even the means to travel for an interview. Uh, maybe those who, who need to do a language course in order to take up an opportunity, job opportunity in another member state. Support is, of course, promotion of labor mobility as, as a right and as something that people voluntarily like to do. This, this is very important. The EU has been promoting it through, through the various, uh, various uh, parts of the Erasmus program, student mobility, but also, also mobility in, not only in universities, but also in vocational education. But we also have the, the, the project which is called the Your First Year as Job. And it's basically a, a scheme which, which helps place people from, from in, into a different country than, than, than where, they, where they are based. 
to take up the first job. It's a very small small scheme, but but uh, it can be potentially scaled up. And I think so this, this is this is the kind of support that, that uh, maybe we are looking for. So the conclusion is that there are measures available. Uh, we shouldn't focus on any more measures uh, because they might be forcing people, uh, or that we should only focus on those that promote rather than convince people to actually move abroad, which is almost more what we're talking about, I think. Uh, Gustav? Yeah, so exactly on that, I think the one problem is that the bridging mechanism you already mentioned is exactly the fact that if you make, like, create some kind of incentives that makes people who are sort of, like how you talked about, like the Erasmus type of, of people, um, make them like want to move, that most of them probably will, um, in the long run, move out of areas that are hit very hard by economic problems because they can move fairly easily, they speak language, have education, and so on. And the point is, once they move out of an area, the people who are left will have very little opportunity left in the area, and they might then eventually feel forced or coerced to move simply by the economic condition. So even if you're not very actively forcing people who wouldn't want to move to move, if at the point where we really create a possibility for everyone with sort of good skills and high education to move, you should take a look at kind of the in countries, the R7 or Sweden, I mean people with universal education tend to want to stay close, <coughs> then people get stuck and then other people have to move and take low wage jobs in the city. Alright, so do you want to respond to that? And I think then we need to move to conclusions already, right? Yes, yeah. Alright, yeah. so thanks. It's a bit of a closing point anyway. I don't want to talk. No, but uh, I, can, I can be only enthusiastic when I listen to the words of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Mrs. Uh, Hesselman. Wow, you have started your. Hesselman's. Uh <laughs> In the way that our generation is, uh, is truly the Erasmus generation. Uh, one of the mottos of, uh, of my association is some call it Europe, we call it home. Um, and, and it goes together in, in the same time of one of the uh, objectives of the European Union, which is the fulfillment of the internal market. And, uh, and I, really, I, really, um, I really enjoy the, the, the last sentence of uh, Flukas saying that uh, free movement of workers is a right. And I would add that, of course, it's not a duty. And it has been, a, it has been highlighted by, uh, by many of you um, during, the, during this debate. What I would like to answer just to Johan about the, the job vacancies, okay, youth mobility is uh, possibly not the miracle solution, but 60% of the job vacancies are not published. So it means that there are much, much more job vacancies um, that nobody knows existing that, that, uh, that actually you're applying to the jobs. Um, and just one last thing about, about, um, about the comment made, made by Sofia. Um, I'm not from uh, southern uh, your countries, but I, I'm French and I hope that I'm rather cozy and I hope that I, that you can consider that I, I like my family white being European. Yeah. 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 We saw this up later, you know. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes, um, well to actually add on to, uh, just, just to put in to uh, um, many of the young uh, uh, representatives um, uh, suggested the idea of a youth uh, job bank uh, um, to have a, a to stimulate, to solve the problem partly through stimulating that open market. But the other question, and it's not one that you have to answer uh, for yourself, but the other question is, um, you may not be willing to move away, but do you think European people, European people in general are ready to welcome each other from other countries mm -hmm. into their own communities mm -hmm. when there might be a work shortage? And that's where you come back to the regional and, and international. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so in line with that, um, just a spontaneous uh, reflection on what I've heard. You know, I think we, sh we should avoid that the European Union becomes an elite uh, process um, uh, in, in which more and more um, uh, the, the gap which is already there, I think you all read about it, between those who are more disadvantaged and those in power uh, is, is uh, widening. And therefore, I, I li liked uh, there in that corner some uh, remarks. Uh, so what problem to solve? And I think we have to really differentiate and make the spectrum as broad as the youths are, actually, in terms of cat categories. So I think that's very important, uh, what I learned now from the discussion and uh, before. Secondly, it are the rights, and everybody has the rights, but I think also I heard the needs. What are the needs? The needs of the people. So again, I come to this differentiation. And there is also the problem height in the needs. So. I think, and then I, my last word again is, uh, and that's also why we as ID exist, <laughs> is actually um, um, 
that I really believe in debate, uh, not only because of that you become good policy makers, etc., but also because it gives a structure to, to really exchange with those who are in need and who really would like to uh, open up their voices. And uh, my, so, so my last point is, again, um, talking about the EU, we're talking about all the people, and I think the people are in the center, and I really would like to stimulate the EU to develop more visible than it is uh, right now, uh, good policies for those who don't feel included in the EU. And uh, there's just, an, uh, without saying that I don't like the Erasmus program, I love it, but I think this is the, the back of this uh, remark. Right, with that, I think we have concluded this fourth motion of uh, this afternoon. It almost feels like evening. Um, and uh, with that, I think we've also closed the debate. Uh, I would like to give a, a short round of applause for all the speakers. For you.